This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula, where episode 2 of Technorama is available now. I've been using Samsung's foldable phones exclusively for approximately a year now, of which two months I've spent on the latest and greatest, the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 3. So I thought it was time for a review from the perspective of a long-term user with a little twist. I bought the Fold 3 because I saw a promise that this could be the first true three-in-one device. A phone, a tablet, now with better tablet software and S Pen support, and a computer with DeX that I just found a use for myself. So this will basically be three reviews in one. I'll take an in-depth look at each of the three form factors. And by the way, the entire script was written on the Fold 3 using DeX and storyboarded with the S Pen. Of the three form factors, I think that of the smartphone is the least interesting one. If you've seen my review of last year's Fold 2, this is mostly the same phone. Same awkward form factor, which I've gotten used to over time, and pretty much the same strength and weaknesses as before, just with a nicer 120Hz display up front I don't actually dislike using now, especially since I've discovered the Niagara launcher. Other than the aspect ratio, the screen is what you'd expect from a Samsung flagship, it's great. The dual speakers are phenomenal, outperforming even many laptops, performance is fantastic through and through, super solid, and while Samsung's once trailblazing One UI looks a tiny bit less exciting to me by now, the software is polished, free of bugs, very customizable, and gets updated like no other except for maybe a Pixel. Four years of timely updates and three of which features from new flagships all get backported is very solid. I'm also still satisfied with battery life, usually getting through a day and a half with about five to eight hours of screen on time on average, and while charging could be a bit faster at just 25 watts, uh, I don't know, it's fine, just like the cameras. Whenever I take photos, I'm generally happy with reliably sharp and bright results, even if sometimes they're a bit oversaturated for my taste, but when I put them side by side with those of more camera-centric phones, there's clearly still room for improvement. The phone is now even water resistant, so really the only thing I don't particularly like about it is the aspect ratio and the fact that it's hard to repair. So the Fold 3 is clearly a decent phone, but the real magic of course happens when we go over to the other two form factors. So let's talk about those. As a tablet, the Fold 3 is a significantly better product than its predecessor was when it came out. The improvements start with the hardware, where the crease feels ever so slightly less present, and the new PET screen protector is miles better than the one that was on the Fold 2. It doesn't feel plasticky, unlike my Fold 2's unit, which started peeling off in the middle after about a month, this seems rock solid, and even though I have used my S Pen on it a lot, there are no scratch marks or dents anywhere. You really just don't notice that it is there at all. Also, I thought this obvious Obviously, first-gen under-display camera would bother me initially, but after a week or two I just never thought about it anymore as it blends right into everything well enough to just not notice, so I kinda like it. Plus, while you shouldn't expect to take amazing selfies with it, I mean there's another selfie camera on the other side of the phone for that, um, nobody's complained about the video quality in something like a zoom call either. The big game changers this year were the better display scaling options, the better multitasking availability, and of course the inclusion of the S Pen, which I think together make this a pretty fantastic tablet on the go. So if an app has tablet mode, it automatically opens that on the big screen, and it usually makes way more sense than the stretched out phone apps that we originally got on the Fold 2, with a decent number of apps actually supporting it. Now a few apps can't actually switch between their tablet modes and their phone modes on the fly, which occasionally makes switching between these two screen's a little bit awkward, but it's rare enough and can be fixed by just reopening the amp, so that doesn't really bother me. Multitasking too just feels way smoother with the optional menu bar on the screen and an easier way of swapping out and arranging apps, which actually got me to use it occasionally, and the optional S Pen is really nice too. I usually draw out a storyboard for each video that I make, and I used to do that on my Surface Pro 7, but this setup? completely removed my need for having a pen in a computer. The pen feels great, it is very responsive with basically no noticeable input lag, it is nicely pressure sensitive, there isn't much jitter as far as I can tell, and it doesn't need to be charged. 
Artists will probably still prefer a more rigid glass screen and more buttons, but for sketching, like I do, it's fantastic, and the size of the canvas makes it way more useful than any note phone that I had in the past. Now, one thing I dislike about the S Pen is that there is no place to store it. I just keep mine in my backpack usually, but Samsung also sells a dedicated case as a pen holder, and that is the single worst Samsung product I have ever seen. It is infuriating. The lightest touch is enough to move the lid, which constantly turns the phone on and drains your battery, the device can't actually lie flat in any orientation when it is open, and there is no way to hold it firmly in either phone mode or tablet mode with the case on. So I've literally dropped my phone three times already because of it. You shouldn't use it, and Samsung should be ashamed of creating it. Oh, and if you're wondering, my Fold 3 is holding up very well to abuse with the phone's frame and lip around the screen absorbing almost all the damage without any issues. I have seen one Flip 3 owner online whose screen cracked unexpectedly, but mine is thankfully doing great. Anyway, in general, I think the Fold 3 is a great tablet. There are some drawbacks, of course, like for example the crease in the middle, but generally the 120Hz large display, as well as all the new software goodies, just make this a pleasure to use for both work and play. Which leads us to the next category. Here's the thing, I already have a MacBook Air and I also have a Windows desktop, so I don't exactly need my phone to turn into a computer as well, but I recently found a pretty cool use case for it and I'm very happy that I did. One day I simply forgot to pack my laptop in my backpack when I went to our studio and then I realized, hey, wait a second, I have a full setup that could actually work with DeX. So I plugged my phone in with a single USB-C cable into my monitor, connected my Logitech MX Master 3, MX keyboard and Sony headphones via Bluetooth and it just worked. Well, after trying seven different goddamn USB-C cables, that is. But other than that, it just worked. DeX only goes up to 1440p, so my 4K monitor feels a little bit sad, but other than that, the phone even charges via USB-C, and you can plug USB devices like a hard drive right into the monitor, and then it just passes that onto the phone too, like a dock. So this is a proper workstation. Your phone is also still usable while in DeX, and DeX actually remembers the apps that you have open when you disconnect and reconnect again, so switching is painless too. And while we are at peripherals, DeX actually recognizes both of my scroll wheels and the multitasking button on my mouse, as well as almost all of the function keys like media controls, the screenshot button, and the lock button on the keyboard too. Pretty amazing. And it's the same story with most Windows keyboard shortcuts as well. Old tabs, which is apps, the Windows key brings up the app launcher, which you can search in right away. Hitting Windows Shift S brings up a screen clipping utility, just like in Windows, plus hitting the Windows plus arrow keys lets you snap apps to the side, just like on Windows. Of course, that also works with the mouse, which in my opinion, bizarrely makes this a better window management experience than what macOS has by default. I've also not yet managed to run into any performance issues, and despite having 10 different apps as well as 20 plus tabs open in my browser, the phone doesn't even get hot, just a little warm. So DeX as a system works remarkably well, and I as a person who's primarily a Windows user actually had an easier time transitioning to DeX than I did to macOS, because of how similarly all the keyboard shortcuts and all the little things are set up compared to Windows. But things start to look a little bit less rosy when we take a look at apps. Samsung's own apps, of course, look and work pretty well on DeX. Some of them you can actually open multiple instances of, and many of them even support keyboard shortcuts like Control T and Control Shift T in the Samsung browser to open tabs, for example. But third party apps are much less reliable. A few apps like Spotify look and work great, they even support keyboard shortcuts, but some, like Notion, simply refuse to be resized, so you're stuck with little windows. Others like Discord or Slack or Firefox can resize, but they only have this mobile UI, which is far from ideal on the long term, meaning that you'll likely have to use Chrome or more probably Samsung Internet as your main browser. And of course, many apps are really not optimized for keyboards or mice at all. In Signal, for example, you can't even hit enter or control enter to send a message. Oof. 
Now, in casual apps where you just send a couple of messages or you scroll around, it's not the end of the world if an app isn't super 100% optimized. It still kind of works. But things do get kind of annoying when we start to do significantly more in-depth work like editing in-depth texts or spreadsheets or anything of the sort. None of the native Android apps work particularly well for text editing. I've tried Notion, which doesn't resize, so there's that. OneNote, which bugs out every half an hour or so, so I have to restart it. And Google Docs, which are infuriating on a keyboard and mouse because a bunch of little weird bugs. So instead, you're likely going to be using the web versions of each, which I've really found only to be usable on Samsung's own browser and also not to 100%. So there's that. You can absolutely get work done on Dex in a pinch, especially if you primarily use the browser. And you know what? I wrote the entire script of this video for about two days on OneNote, the native Android app. And even though it was a little bit annoying, it was fine. But um, I wouldn't choose this as my primary platform if I had a choice for now, which is a shame, but also an opportunity. Because Dex itself works fine. It's polished and I bet that on the Fold 3 it actually performs significantly better than many laptops do. It's just that apps aren't optimized. But now that Android apps are coming to Windows 11 and Android tablets with keyboards are finally gaining popularity, especially in education and with corporate clients, I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or two from now those would improve significantly too. As of now though, I think Dex is great for a day when you maybe forget your laptop or something, but unless you're willing to completely rethink your workflow and reconstruct it around Dex, I wouldn't recommend throwing your laptop away for it just yet. So overall, the Galaxy Z Fold 3 is an incredibly versatile machine, and even though it doesn't excel in either of the three form factors, it can do all three surprisingly well. It is my phone, of course, but it is also my sort of teleprompter that I read from for every video, my sketchbook for storyboards, and even my desktop in a pinch. And then I just fold it up and it fits into my pocket. Which is the kind of future that as a kid watching sci-fi movies growing up, I wished I could do in the future. Computers and science fiction movies have served as inspiration for tech companies like Samsung since the early days. But have you ever wondered what served as the inspiration for those filmmakers who dreamt up all of those amazing computers? Well, that's what we explore in episode 2 of Technorama, my Nebula original, that is streaming on Nebula right now. We're taking a look at 6 movies from the 60s to the 80s and we're breaking down the hidden technologies and the historical and economic events that led to their creations, explaining what Ronald Reagan had to do with the creation of killer robots, for example. Technorama is of course on Nebula, our very own video streaming platform built by some of YouTube's smartest educational creators, and it hosts not only complete originals like Technorama and many more, but also our regular YouTube videos ad-free and without tracking, often a day or two early, little bonus segments after videos, and more. If you'd like to support our work and get high quality extra content in return, Nebula is the best way to do it, and signing up is super affordable with the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle. At just 15 bucks for an entire year, not a month, but an entire year, you can get access to all of Nebula and all of CuriosityStream, which of course is the premier place on the internet for high quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, with a huge library of science, nature and history content to watch, such as Engineering the Future, which I think my audience would particularly like. So check it out at the link in the description, subscribe and I'll see you next week.